the irony is that if you talk to a hundred people who have made bold change and kind of pushed through that fear, 99 of them would say it was absolutely the right decision. Right. It's that, there's that saying, you know, everything you want is on the other side of fear. Welcome to Find Your Freedom, the best entrepreneurship podcast. Being an entrepreneur is hard. Doug and I struggled for years of being unfulfilled in corporate life before we went out on our own. Then it just got harder when we became an entrepreneur. We started FYF to be a one-stop shop, pulling the knowledge and resources from the most interesting and experienced entrepreneurs we could find to help aspiring entrepreneurs have best chance of finding their own freedom. Check out all the resources in our entrepreneurship ebook for free at findyourfreedompod.com. Also, be sure to share this episode with a friend who could use some entrepreneurial inspiration. We just finished recording with Kevin Dahlstrom. It was an incredible discussion of his early career at a big consulting firm, then realizing the corporate world was not for him, and eventually finding his own freedom with a VC startup called Swell. I think you're going to love this discussion. It was super insightful, and a lot of what he said really resonated with Doug and I. Enjoy. Yo, 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 yo. Today we get the pleasure of digging into entrepreneurship and life with Kevin Dahlstrom, founder and CEO of Swell, a financial technology company that helps mark, uh, make smart money moves. Before that, Kevin was a marketing guru in the corporate world. Welcome, Kevin. We're super excited to have you on with us today. Hey, thanks, guys. Uh, based on our short discussion before we started recording, this is going to be a lot of fun. Welcome to the podcast, Kevin. Thank you, Doug. Kevin, let's jump right in here with um, with Twitter. You've been blowing up there lately. I've been personally enjoying your threads and seeing how viral they're going. What do you think it is that you're writing that you think is connecting with so many different communities? Yeah, so um, I guess I'll rewind a little bit. You know, I've been on Twitter, I think, since 2007, so forever, but I was always just a lurker. And then, you know, when the pandemic hit, you guys probably can relate, you know, we're all sitting at home during the lockdown. And I was like, you know what? I love writing. I'd love to have a practice of writing. So I just started posting stuff, you know, z I basically zero followers. And, you know, uh, what I write about is really just my life experiences having, you know, as I joke, ha having learned everything the hard way. I'm 52 now. I've had a ton of experiences in business and in life. And I think if there's anything that resonates with people, sort of the, the the central theme of what I write about is, you know, challenging the definition of what success is. You know, if you're at a dinner party and someone says, you know, so-and-so is a really successful person, we all know what they're talking about, right? They're talking about <laughs> business success as measured in money. And, you know, I've learned that the old cliche is true, right? Money can't buy happiness. And, you know, my point of view is that the, the happiest life is a multidimensional life. And what that means is, you have multiple passionate pursuits, um, and none of them is uh, your your identity doesn't sort of reside in any one of them. Your your identity is multidimensional, you know. And there, there's this kind of false belief out there that you know to be successful in your career, you have to sort of be all in. That has to be your sole focus. And I just categorically reject that. And I like to think I'm living proof that that doesn't have to be the case. I believe you can kick ass at everything. And so I think that's a message that resonates with a lot of people. Yeah, I think um, uh, sort of leaning into that, one of the most popular threads you had was where you were listing, I think it was the 17 most important lessons that you learned. I was wondering if there was one or two of them that you thought would best apply to our audience, which is mostly aspiring entrepreneurs and, um, and, and how impactful you think they could change their lives with altering a couple of these things from the lessons you've learned. Yeah, that was one of my first viral tweets. And what you mentioned beforehand that you were maybe going to talk about it. So I went back and read it again because I'd forgotten <laughs> a, a lot of what I had said there. Um, but, but I think the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of answer that with a story. It's like if you went out and talked to a bunch of elderly people and you said, you know, what are the things that you tr have treasured most in life? What are the things that you treasure most today? You know, what are they going to talk about? They're going to talk about people, right? The relationships and the people that they love. They're going to talk about the things they did with those people, the experiences. And so I think the takeaway from that is in the end, all that really matters is relationships and experiences. So you should really optimize your life around that. And then, uh, so that's one. And then one um, second uh, item that I mentioned in that thread 
is the importance of place. And this is sort of a hot take of mine, a little bit contrarian. You know, where you choose to live is really the one decision that impacts literally everything in your life, right? So I, I refer often to the place you live as your aquarium, right? It, it is, you're immersed in it 24 seven, right. arguably has an even bigger impact than your life partner. Yet uh, most people aren't very deliberate about where they choose to live. They sort of live where they live because that's where they live. Great point. So that's the second thing I'd say is like, that's one thing that is a big, scary change. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about, well, gee, I'd love to live here. What a great life it would be. But few people actually make that change. That's the second thing is like, to be bold and, and be really deliberate about where you live. Yeah, take a step back and even uh, just to recognize that that is a choice. I think, like you said, most people are just like, oh, I'm here. There's no thought about where I should be. And uh, that's one thing I think my wife and I did do pretty well. It's like, where's a good spot that we want to raise our kids that's diverse, that has certain you know traits that we're really looking for? And I think that's um, really helped impact the community that we've been able to build here where we are. So I, I totally subscribe to that. Yeah, and I'm... That's a great example, uh, actually, of when I say I've learned everything the hard way, because I was that person who, you know, I was born and raised in Texas. Honestly, like I, I remember even as a child feeling like it wasn't really my place. It wasn't really my tribe. Yet I lived there for the first 45 years of my life wow. Wow. Um, because, you know, that that's, you know, objects at rest tend to stay at rest. <laughs> and um, so that's why I, I feel so strongly about it is like, really, when you're younger, be very deliberate about that. And especially now more than ever in the wake of COVID, you know, we have the option to work remotely. So many knowledge workers have that option. That's right. So what an amazing opportunity. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And now um, I think you're in Colorado and it seems like every picture you post is just you climbing these beautiful rock formations and being out in the backcountry. I'm like, man, this guy really seems like he's found a perfect spot for himself. And it can, you can tell that there's a lot of harmony with you being there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, rock climbing was something that really changed my life. I've been a rock climber for 25 years and obviously you know, played a huge role in moving to Boulder, which is where I live now. I'm looking out of the window right now at the Flatirons, which are the big rock formations above Boulder. I love it. Um, yeah, I still pinch myself. I and mean, that's why I feel so strongly about this, this idea of place, because I still pinch myself every day that I get to live in this playground. So cool. Yeah, I, th I do the same thing. I'm a few miles from the beach. I get to bike down to the beach or run down to the beach and basically run on the beach where people vacation. And it's just like, a, you know, taking that moment to really appreciate I'm in, you know, one of the best places that people go to for vacationing. People go to your, you know, where you live for <laughs> and taking that moment to appreciate it and and uh, and have the proper perspective of how fortunate we are, I think can really help you appreciate a lot of other things in life. So I love that, um, that trait you have. Yeah. I mean, I talk a lot about, you know, building a life that you don't need a vacation from. I mean, <laughs> I still take, I still go on vacations with my family and whatnot, but honestly, on about half of the vacations I go on, I find myself about halfway through wishing I was back in Boulder. So yeah, that, that's when you know you found the right place. Yeah, that's a good sign. If you're on vacation, you're like, man, I can't wait to get back home. Yeah, exactly. Let's zoom out here um, real quick. Uh, so you were living the corporate life. You were a marketing guru for some, um, uh, I think, NYU uh, publicly traded companies. Can you take us back to when you had the realization that you wanted to go out on your own and sort of talk us through how that progressed? Yeah, I've had, I think, a um, really unique career in the sense that I've always had one foot in the entrepreneurial world and one foot in sort of corporate America. So going way back, um, I actually began my career as a consultant working for one of the big, the big firms, but very quickly went the entrepreneurial route. So I actually founded my first company at age 28. First one was a spectacular failure. I did it again and had a big success. And through mergers and acquisitions and whatnot, I ended up along the way working for some bigger companies. And, you know, I think there's pros and cons to each, um, but I'm definitely more of an entrepreneur at heart. So here I am back at, you know, I've got another, another startup swell. But I think the common theme, you know, to, to answer your question about sort of, you know, how do you make that decision? I think for uh, an entrepreneur, it has to be something that you can't not do. Um, I think, you know, in, in my case, I just love building stuff, right? And um, I like building stuff even more than I like making money. Money's always nice. But if you have that, if you're that type of person, if you're wired to just build stuff, then uh, I think um, entrepreneurism is the best way to do that. Because ultimately, within a larger company, you only have so much freedom to build. And by the way, 
that's not everybody and there's no right or wrong path. Uh, it just happens to be the way I'm wired. And I think most on- entrepreneurs are wired. They, they get a lot of joy out of building things, starting with a blank canvas. Yeah. And, and, and I love that you restated that twice um, in that section is that there is no right choice. And that's something that Doug and I really like to go back to a lot. You know, this podcast is for people who are unhappy or unfulfilled in their corporate job. But there is such a huge percentage of people that really enjoy that atmosphere, really enjoy that type of work. And and that is awesome. And we think that that's critical for their happiness and their life success in, for, in, in America. This podcast is for, you know, for you and for me and Doug, you know, we all kind of tasted that and we just, it just didn't really fit um, until we got into the entrepreneurship and starting our own business. Then it's like, oh, this really gets my blood flowing. I, I, yeah. this is what I want to do the rest of my life. So, so I love that you make that distinction that there's so many right paths, but everyone has to find their own path to make their own, um, you know, their own self happy in all these different balls you're trying to balance in the world, right? And profession is one of those larger balls. Absolutely. And honestly, these days, the world has changed. and You can kind of have the best of both worlds. You can have your cake and eat it too. (laughs) Uh, I'll use a specific example. One of my um, climbing partners uh, here in Boulder, he's a 34-year-old guy. He has a corporate job, but he works remotely. He's highly paid. He's like a director of finance. So he makes like makes like a couple hundred grand a year working remotely from wherever he chooses. He's single. So he's, he's constantly traveling. Um, he, honestly, he works about 20 hours a week. So it's not a crazy work schedule. So he has high income, his cost of living's low, but he saves money and he does side hustles. So he's, he's in the past two years, he's bought three real estate properties as investments. I love it. And so, you know, I don't know what you would call that. Is that, is that entrepreneurism or not? In some ways he's like a scope. He's like a solopreneur working for a company and doing side hustles. I think that's the new way to be. I mean, look, if you can get a high paying corporate job that doesn't require you to be in an office and pays really well, I think that's an incredible path, at least to get started. Yeah, I think the hybrid, I think the hybrid uh, situation is set up is becoming more and more the rage uh, with, like you said, like the work from home. If you're working from home, it gives you that flexibility to get your work done for your day job, your main job, primary, uh, your primary position, but it also gives you that freedom to explore and pursue other, other, uh, side gigs that, that could turn into something. Yeah. Because look, if you want to go pure, the purely entrepreneurial route, there's a lot of heartache down that path. You have to really want it. I think, um, one, one thing I always think about is, uh, Elon Musk was doing an interview and, and somebody in the crowd said, Here's my situation, blah, 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 blah. Should I, uh, should I start uh, a business? And Elon Musk's answer was great. He said, if you have to ask, the answer is no. <laughs> right? You have to have such strong conviction because so much heartache lies down that path that you have to have a ton of conviction to kind of power through it. Otherwise, you're better off getting like a high paying remote job, like Doug was saying. Yeah, one of the things I really wanted to know more about was, could you dig into what exactly Swell is, why you started it? at this point and what your goal is long-term? Because I think it's so interesting. Yeah. Um, Well, Swell was honestly the result of a failed retirement. (laughs) So I I moved to Boulder five years ago and um, my intent was to be sort of semi-retired, do a bunch of angel investing, which I did. I just didn't find it all that fulfilling. And I had this this itch that kept getting stronger. You know, I've, I've I've spent most of my career in consumer financial services, so I'm painfully aware of all the many ways in which banking is broken for customers. And we all deal with this every day. I mean, you visit your local bank, you can, it's a target rich environment. You can see all sorts of ways in which your, your bank is broken. So Swell is a banking startup and um, we have a big vision, but right now we're laser focused on the credit card problem. So in the U.S., um, credit card balances are at an all time high. The APRs or interest rates that people are paying on those balances are at an all-time high. The percentage of consumers who are revolving their debt month over month is at an all-time high. And so Swell's uh, initial value proposition is really simple. It's an app that's attached to a personal line of credit, and we allow you to transfer your credit card balances in at a significantly lower rate. So for our typical customer who we target, it would mean thousands of dollars in savings and the ability to pay down their debt years faster. And so, you know, we're starting out with a pretty powerful value proposition. Over time, that grows into more of a full-service consumer banking solution. Gotcha. 
But for now, it's very much focused on the credit card problem. One thing that I think is really interesting is how wise you were in timing the growth of swell exactly with interest rates rising. That was really um, good foresight you had to, to, to know that interest rates were going to go from zero to 5%. It's like, wow, this guy is really in tune with yeah. the financial. Have you ever uh, heard the saying, I'd rather be lucky than smart? Yes. I, I heard that one. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that though, because I, uh, I'm writing a, a piece for Twitter right now. And the theme of it is basically like over my long career, I've met literally hundreds of CEOs, founders, executives in companies, business owners, and um, I see no formula for success other than hard work and getting lucky. And I, I look back on the successes that I've had, and and those are the two ingredients. And you know, um, anybody that thinks they have a repeatable formula is probably delusional. Um, <laughs> there are a few outliers like Elon Musk who seem to have repeated big successes, but for most of us. The only formula is hard work and a little bit of luck. Yeah, totally agree. Um, you gotta have you gotta have a little bit of um, fortunate circumstances on top of the the work ethic and and the grind. Um, now, similar to myself and Jonathan, uh, you've you've spent a, a decent portion of your career working in corporate, and it yep. sounds like you've kind of been in and out um, at some at some points of your career. You've been in the corporate world. Other parts, you've been exploring your entrepreneurial passions. Yep. Um, going back and looking at um, either when you started Swell or with one of the early businesses that you started, can you talk about overcoming the fears and the limiting beliefs that that you were facing when you're thinking about, okay, I'm, I have a steady paycheck, I have a good living here, I know that um, you know the 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 money I'm going to earn from this job is going to feed the family, etc. But at the same time, when you're thinking about going out on your own, you know, we all have these limiting beliefs. So what was that like for you, either in the early days of starting your companies or with starting Swell? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, you know, for me, there has to be like an irresistible draw. There has to be something that is irresistible about going out on your own. Because like I said earlier, otherwise, it's frankly just not worth the heartache. And for me, the irresistible draw was freedom in all its forms, right? So Obviously, um, I was always a little bit different. Like I never really fit into corporate America because um, even before it was acceptable or cool, I hated being in an office. Uh, I want to wear a t-shirt and shorts every day when I can. Um, and, and I hate meetings. I, I do my best work in open space. And so the draw for me was like being able to work in the way that's most conducive for success for me. And that means like having control over my calendar, having control over where I work, uh, having control over what I work on. I mean, I, you know, obviously, you know, the, the great thing about starting a company is you get to choose exactly what you're building and what you're working on. Now, hopefully you're right, because if you're wrong, the consequences are pretty big. But um, for me, that was the big draw. And, uh, you know, I guess um, on the, the fear and sort of limiting belief side, I do believe pretty strongly, kind of back to that Elon Musk quote about, you know, if you have to have to ask, it's not for you. I think ultimately, if if you're 50-50 on it, then probably it's not for you. Mm. I think the to 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 be to take that kind of risk on behalf of your family, I think the the calculus has to be pretty clear. Yeah. I think you know, you have to be like, you know, it's never a hundred percent, but you gotta be like 75%, you know, uh convicted that this is the right path. That's really interesting because yeah, I think um I think we've talked about before how you have to kind of do a, a self-assessment personality test and, and make sure that you are cut out for this life and that uh, you do have that type of um, uh, uh, mindset, I guess. Yep. And um, yeah, it, it, it's really important, I think, to, to recognize that it's, it's not for everyone. So um, now, how did, you, uh, how did you develop your business model? So obviously, coming into Swell, you came in with a ton of experience already. Um, but obviously, too, um, you know, usually the business that you start day one looks a lot different, 6, 12, 18 months down the road. Uh, how did you develop the business model and, and how did the iteration process look like for, for Swell? Well, I believe, I mean, and a lot of VCs will say this too, venture capitalists, is that the, the, the best way to approach the kind of what kind of business should I start or what problem should I solve is that start with a problem that you have personally felt the pain of yeah. and that you have unique insight into. So in my case, 
I have spent most of my career in consumer financial services, so I'm painfully aware of all the problems and all the opportunities that those those present. I have pretty unique insight into those because I've put in the years, I've got the experience. But also these are problems that just like at a very personal level really irk me. Like I, to be honest, like I hate big banks. I just think they, um, you know, they uh, ask a lot uh, of their customers and don't provide a lot in return. And, you know, there's been numerous examples of that. And so some of it for me is a personal mission because here's the thing. If you don't really care about the problem that you're trying to solve, like, like deeply inside, then when the chips are down and they, and there will be periods where you're struggling, it's going to be hard to push through. I think, um, and, and the other thing is if you're working on something that you truly care about and, and where you're learning and you're excited about it, then there's no losing for you. Like the company may fail, but ultimately you have won because you got to work on a problem you really cared about and you learned a lot and you yep. met great people or whatever. And you parlay that into the next thing, because that's another, um, aspect I think of entrepreneurship that a lot of people miss. And this is especially true if you're going to do like venture back tech startups, which is mostly what I've done is you have to take a portfolio view of your career. Meaning that if you're just going to try it once and you either succeed or fail, well, statistically, you're probably going to fail. Um, so it, given that you have to think about it, like, look, if I fail, I'm going to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Right. And over the course of a career, you know, four five, six, eight ventures, whatever, um, if you're smart and deliberate and learn, you're eventually going to find something that works. And right. th that's the portfolio view. Yeah. I think taking that long view is so important. We get so caught up in the day to day of what we're doing right now today. It can be tough to, to take a step back and look at the big picture. And when you, but when you can look at that big picture, it helps you to power through some of those, those early challenges that, that we're all going to face, uh, on the way to success. So, um, one of the things, uh, uh, that we've noticed and appreciated from your Twitter profile is you say, I learned everything the hard way so that you don't have to. And that aligns so well with, uh, you know, what we're doing here at FYF. We look at this as the podcast that we wish we had when we were coming up and we, we hope to help our uh, audience of aspiring entrepreneurs learn from all the mistakes, you know, that we made and that our guests made along the way so that it's a little bit easier path for them. What, what would you say is the biggest mistake that you made early on in your career uh, that you look back on and go, man, I'd like to to share that so others don't have to suffer that pain. Yeah, no, a great question. And this is something I end up um, mentoring young, uh, especially men on a lot. And look, when I, um, I came out of school, let's say college, you know, I was a classic achiever type, right? So you point me in any direction, I'm going to take the hill. Now, I might leave a lot of carnage behind. It may not be the right <laughs> hill, whatever. Um, but that was sort of my mentality. And, and at the time, I sort of bought into what society was saying uh, in terms of what success is, right? So you you work your way up the corporate ladder and you do this. And, and the thought of like having a great lifestyle wasn't even something, wasn't even a consideration. And so, you know, I kind of put my head down and took this hill of, uh, a misguided definition of success. So I'd say to, to answer the question very directly, it's like the biggest mistake I made or the thing that I wish somebody would have told me is like, hey, take a second and define what success means for you, not what society tells you success. Like, like no, literally, I advise people to literally write it, write it down as bullet points. Like what, what, what does that um, end state, I call it the end state lifestyle look like? And be very granular, like, Who's part of that lifestyle? How are you spending your time? What types of projects are you working on? Where are you? Um, what does a day look like? All those things. Because here's the thing, until you at least take a stab at defining that endpoint really clearly, how can you know what decisions to make today, right? It may, it may sound like a great decision to do what I did and take a high paying consulting job. Unfortunately though, for me, that was like a path to misery. That wasn't actually a step um, along the path that I should have been taken. So I made it, as I mentioned, I think a little bit before we started recording, I made a major course correction. In my case, it wasn't until my mid forties. And so what I'm trying to help others do through a lot of my writing on Twitter is to force those decisions a lot at, at a much younger age. I like that your answer is just, it's not like a one size fits all solution for everybody. They have to look within and ask themselves that question based on the type of person I am and, and what I care about and what's important to me. How do I 
take steps towards achieving those, those goals that I have for myself. I think it's so hard. Like a lot of people just, like you said, they kind of follow along with what, um, you know, their, their teachers, parents, advisors tell them to do. And they just do that, put their head down and they wake up one day and they're 40, 50, 60 years old. And they're like, that wasn't really what I yeah. wished I would have done. Yeah. And I'll give you just, just to be really clear on this point, cause I think it's a really important one. I'll give you like some bullet points from my personal definition of an in-state lifestyle. And, and, and there's probably, I don't know, there's probably 20 bullet points on my personal list. I've probably achieved, you know, I'm 52 years old. So I've probably achieved, you know, 17 or 18 of them. So I'm, I'm a good bit of the way there, but it's things like mornings free to read, write, and think. That's an important um, success factor for me. Controlling 90% of my schedule, lots of sunshine and time outside, ability to live and work anywhere. And those are unique to me. To your point, Doug, somebody else's list might look completely different. They may value different things, but that's my list. And certainly if I had been more deliberate about this list at a younger age, just taking the time to define it, then I probably would have gotten there faster. Yeah, totally. I think one thing that really stands out from everything you're saying, Kevin, is um, I just I'm sitting here thinking how fortunate I feel to be able to have access to Twitter, to be able to meet people like you and have a brief interaction, kind of appreciate you from afar or lurk, as you were saying earlier, you know, appreciate your your deep, thoughtful threads from afar. And then now, you know, fast forward a couple of weeks, you're here on our podcast sharing your amazing experience on life and your profession, you know, with our audience. So I'm wondering if you could kind of expand on ju not just the use of Twitter, but networking as a whole. Um, I think a lot of, of the mentees that I have, you know, I'll talk about Twitter, I'll talk about building a network. And for some reason, there seems to be a disconnect in, you know, them wanting to take that chance to reach out to, to DM someone you know, to whatever. Can you talk about uh, sort of Twitter first about how that's impacting your life and 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 reaching out to you know, you know, talk to you know people like you, um, and then just networking as a whole, how that's impacted you? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 not an exaggeration to say that Twitter has been life changing for me, and I think a lot of people will relate to what I'm about to say is that uh, believe it or not, I'm actually a pretty reclusive person. Like I I live in my little bubble here in Boulder. I do my things. I'm a creature of habit, and I don't actually I'm like. I am the opposite of a mingler. When I go to conferences, I usually end up in my hotel room, you know, sending emails. <laughs> I just don't like that sort of interaction. Um, and, and so like a lot of people call that like um, uh, an introverted extrovert. Like in the right circumstances, I really light up. Like right. usually it's small group conversations like this, but I just don't like the traditional sort of like networking type, uh, what, what we think of as networking. Right. Um, but Twitter has been amazing because you can meet people who share all of your same esoteric interests. Um, and then you can translate that into real life, into really meaningful interactions. And I, I would say um, I've now met probably over 50 people through Twitter. I've met them in real life and they are ex every single one of them has been exactly the person I thought they were. And I, I consider some of them, some of my best friends now. And, and That's awesome. the, the, you can go deep very, very quickly uh, it's an incredible tool. And I think, you know, there is some hesitation by some to kind of put themselves out there. And what I'd say is like the beauty of starting to engage on Twitter is um, even if no one ever, uh, if, even if you're shouting into the void, right, you're tweeting into the void, no one follows you, no one listens. Just the, the practice of writing and publishing your thoughts has incredible benefits for you, right? Nothing sharpens thinking like writing. And so there's, it's a no lose proposition, but more likely what will happen is over time, you'll make connections that will change your life. I love that. Yeah, that's so powerful. I think that um, one of the challenges is that Twitter seems for some reason, maybe it's a generational thing with the younger people, that it has kind of a negative um, um, uh, connection for some people. Do you, do you get that from other people out there? Because I feel like when I tell people like, oh yeah, I met this awesome person through Twitter, or I've been having this really cool interaction through Twitter. They're just like Twitter, really? Do you do you get that at all? Um, maybe a little bit. Just that Twitter is sort of like the oddball social network. It's right. text based. I think what people don't understand is that there's two Twitters. There's mass Twitter, which is what most people participate yes. in, which is like I'm following my favorite, you know, athletes and celebrities, whatever. 
And that's not fundamentally different from TikTok or Instagram or whatever. And then there's community Twitter, which is where these little niches are formed organically. That's where the real value and real connection is. Most people haven't found their niche on Twitter because it does take a little bit of work and engagement. That's where the magic happens, though, within these little communities. Yeah, curate your own group, and then that's all the stuff that you're seeing. That's kind of what I always kind of reference. God, I love that. That's right. There's a huge curation aspect to Twitter that really doesn't isn't much of a thing on the other platforms because you're just there for sort of like lean back entertainment, yep. and you're following people who are your in real life friends. Yeah, uh, Twitter is very much about curation. You sort of get out of it what you put into it. Absolutely. Um, I was I was curious what attributes you would attribute your success to. There's that success word again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and again, yeah, it depends. You know, uh, be very careful about how we define success. Um, but you know, I, I I was saying earlier that um, you know I've. You know, the ingredients for success in my estimation are pretty simple, which is hard work applied over time and then maybe sprinkle in a little bit of luck. And, you know, I think the easiest way to work hard on something is to pursue things that you're passionate about. So I've been very fortunate or maybe it's uh, it's been a, a choices I've made or a combination of both that I've always been able to work on things that I really cared about. And as a result, I'm sort of a 24 seven guy, like I'm always working, always playing um, and, you know, you do that compounded over 20, 25, 30 years, you can get a lot done. So I've done, you know, an extraordinary number of, you know, really cool things just as a result of showing up every single day. Uh, and, and, you know, look, in, especially in the early stages of a career, saying yes a lot. Like, I think a lot of people sort of objects at rest stay at rest. And um, I made a deliberate choice to say yes and to be to take action, to do rather than to talk. All those things, like, you know, a lot of people talk about this idea of increasing your surface area for serendipity. And that's really what it's about by, by taking action, by doing, by working hard, by showing up every day, you're increasing your surface area for serendipity. And what happens is over time, some form of success becomes absolutely inevitable. Increasing your surface area for serendipity. Man, I love that. I love it. Um, so I... I personally believe you, you also touched on choice there. Um, I believe at the end of the day, our, our life is as good as the choices that we make. I look back on, um, you know, I was I was fortunate to go to UC Santa Barbara, where probably the most fun party school that a guy could could go to. Uh -huh. And I made the choice uh, my junior year to take on an internship where I was going to go uh, skip a bunch of the weekends partying, skip the spring break, and go knock on doors to 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 do an internship and create a, a, a business in college. And I look back on that choice now and I go, man, that, that choice really set me up for my future. What, what choice do you look back on? Do you have one that stands out in your mind as like, man, that choice um, was the huge catalyst that, that helped set me up? Yeah, I think um, recognizing early on that the corporate life probably wasn't for me. I mean, I mentioned that I started my career in management consulting, but I only lasted a couple of years because it was clear. I looked at the, the, the people at the top of the food chain and consulting, the partners who were making tons of money, but they were miserable. They had a terrible life. They were working harder than anybody, traveling constantly. They had broken relationships. And I think that was a huge kind of fork in the road for me is recognizing like, okay, that I do not want to be that person. <laughs> And um, so that kind of started my entrepreneurial journey. And I've kind of gone back and forth. Like I said, I've had one foot in both worlds on and off throughout my career, but I've always done it in a way that allowed me to control my lifestyle. And so I think if I was ahead of the curve on anything, especially for my generation, it was um, really designing a lifestyle. I mean, th that's common now, like a lot of millennials and younger generations, like everybody's trying to do that. Um, but that was not common back during the the nineties when I came out of college, like there was, you know, it was the old, like sort of model of like, you sit in your cubicle and you grind it out for 30 years and then you have a good, a good lifestyle. Of course it never plays out that way. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say that's like early on, I, I definitely recognized that the, um, the, the, the sort of corporate standard path was not for me. Sounds like you, uh, were enjoying and subscribing to lifestyle design prior to Tim Ferriss, I think, coining that term in the early <laughs> 2000s. 
Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because that's true, but also even on the health side, on the biohacking side, you know, Tim Ferriss sort of um, made his name initially almost more as like a, a health biohacker. Right. I was way ahead of the curve on that too. I was, I was one of the OG biohackers because <laughs> the other thing I recognized is that a really important part of uh, having a great life was being like really healthy and fit and having passionate athletic pursuits. And so that was something I invested in as well. Yeah. I think Jonathan and I are both big on that. We've always, he and I kind of grew up together where you're apart. We're kind of like brothers. And so just, you know, always being um, into playing basketball, playing soccer, playing tennis, whatever it is, and just competing with each other and staying physically fit uh, to fuel the mind uh, has always been a big part of his life and mine as well. Um, you dropped so much great advice and gem after gem after gem today, Kevin, what, was there one piece of advice that you received along the way that, that stuck with you, that you, that you can uh, share with us? Um, let me think about that for a second. Uh, yeah, I actually, I'd say it's, it's, it's pretty obvious, uh, is that, you know, um, my dad actually told me, my, my dad gave me a lot of bad advice. I had a sort of, bit of a colorful childhood, but one thing he really told me is be super deliberate and careful about who you choose as your life partner. And, um, I would say, you know, um, that that's probably the thing that's contributed. If you, if you, you know, to any success that I've had in life, that's been, um, the number one component behind it is my, my wife, Megan. And I would uh, extrapolate that to say that, again, I've met a lot of successful people in my life. And I would say that, basically a hundred percent of them have, um, an equally amazing spouse right beside them. And, and, and furthermore, that spouse generally tends to be someone who has a very different and complementary personality and skill set. That seems to be a key to success. Uh, and so, yeah, I'd say that's, that's the, like the number one piece of advice is probably, um, you know, choose the right partner because, just like I, you know, kind of my, my, um, rant about choosing your place to live. I mean, those are the two things that are, that are kind of like at a meta level going to influence literally everything you do. The rest is sort of details to be honest. Right. Yeah. Those are, those are huge impacts on your life. Um, once, once you, once you make them, uh, I, I wanted to also say thanks so much, um, you know, for fighting through the cold with us today. I super, yeah. I super appreciate that. Um, we're, we're, we're battling it too, but man, I, it's so, this has been so insightful. And I think the, the, um, advice both on life and profession has been just so valuable for our audience. Um, I was wondering one question that we ask all of our guests that has a completely different answer with each one is how you would personally define entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. And first of all, uh, this has been a lot of fun and and I have been battling through a cold just so the listeners and viewers know you'll hear me uh, sneezing, wiping my nose. <laughs> I'm I'm in the midst of battling a pretty nasty, I guess, late spring cold. So oh, we appreciate uh, it. We're powering through today. It hasn't impacted your performance at all. You've been crushing it. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, if you can imagine, I'm normally even higher energy. <laughs> but but uh, I think your question was, uh, was how, how to define entrepreneurship? How would you define it? Yes. Yeah. I think the simplest way that I would think about it is, um, is that you own the risk and reward in what you're doing. Like if you've heard, you know, the idea of like a single ringable neck, your neck's on the line, you only eat what you kill. To me, that's the difference between, you know, a corporate life and entrepreneurship is, you know, you get both the upside and the downside of whatever you're doing. And, um, so, and, and per our earlier discussion, you know, some people that scares the shit out of them. Right. Um, and some people that is, feels very natural and they wouldn't have it any other way. And I think, you know, that's a good, another lens to think about this idea of whether you should be an entrepreneur or not is understanding that, you know, yes, everybody gets excited about the payoff, right? You're, you company goes public or it makes a ton of profit or whatever. Um, but the reality is it's a big, you know, any entrepreneur will tell you it's a big struggle to get there. There's a ton of risk and, you know, most ventures fail. That's just the statistic. And right. so, uh, I think it's really important to, to, I think it's a great question that you guys asked because it's really important to understand what entrepreneurship really is and what it means, uh, the implications of making that choice. Right. Yeah. The dichotomy of, accepting the risk and almost kind of um, really taking it in saying like, I love that there's this risk on it. It keeps me going. It keeps me motivated. 
Whereas there is more of a safety net in the more corporate traditional um, way of doing things. And I love how you keep referencing back, you know, obviously you were, uh, uh, you know, doing really well in college. You ended up at one of the jobs that people actually go to college. They're like, man, I hope I can go to college and do well enough to get one of the jobs that Ke- that Kevin got going out of college. And then once you were in it, you're looking around saying like, this doesn't fit me. And, uh, and I love how you really kind of have talked about going in and out with one foot into entrepreneurship. And then now that you've, um, I, you know, you kind of did a reset on your life, you said, now you really kind of just letting this entrepreneurship take over. And, um, and I love the, the, it's, I think you said about 17 of the things on your life to do list, you've already, um, you've already hit, which one of those um, uh, achievements, do you feel like is the one that has been the best um, ROI for you? Or which one were you most happy to cross out? I'm curious. Um, of the of the kind of things on my ideal life list. Yes. Yeah. You were going through some bullet points. Yeah. Yeah. Without question, for me, it's control of time. Um, I I mentioned earlier that I do my my best work in open space. I'm I'm a creatively wired individual. And so what sucks my energy is uh, a packed calendar and um, and, and, and having to be in a certain place at a certain time, namely an office. And so for me, the huge payoff uh, from sort of going down the entrepreneurial path, as I said earlier, is just gaining that control over place and time without question. I mean, um, I, I pinch myself every day that I get to live in an amazing place and I largely get to decide what I do every day. Now, now people should not hear that wrong. I still work probably harder than most people. Um, but I do it um, exactly the way I want to and when I want to. And to me, that that's as good as it gets. Yeah, exactly. On your terms and knowing how you're most productive. You know, I think I'm kind of a similar way where it's like, I, you know, I have a, a narrower time of um, working nowadays. But when I'm in there grinding, I feel like I'm so productive because I have it locked away in that. And I'm able to be extra productive because I already got my run on the beach out of the way. I already got some sunshine, did some meditation. And now when I'm grinding, it's like I'm locked in on that. Whereas a lot of people, I think that's right in their, you know, in their corporate job, in their office, they're kind of sitting there kind of half working half the day or half, you know, maybe less than half the day. And I talked to some friends that kind of have those jobs and it's just like, um, you know, it's like, man, I think they'd say like, oh, I could probably do my job in a couple hours, but you're there for nine Yeah, they're like, I got to be here for eight hours, regardless of how long the actual work's going to take. Oh, it's insane. And look, I, I could go on a whole rant about this because- what we're seeing is, you know, most of the people listening to this podcast are probably knowledge workers. And the nature of knowledge work is that it's not linear and predictable, yet we still cling to the old factory work model, right. eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, you sit in one location. And that's just absurd. Knowledge work is happens in fits and spurts. It's very unpredictable. Right. And so you're right that honestly, like at the level of intensity I work at when I'm focused, I can't sustain that for more than three or four hours. Right. So exactly like you said, Jonathan, um, you know, I'll I'll go find my inspiration, do what I have to do. I'll do my focused work. I'll take a break, spend time with family. Maybe I'll come back to it later in the day. You should be able to work when you're feeling motivated and inspired. I don't know why that's not obvious to people. <laughs> Hopefully one day. It's incorrect programming from our from our childhood and from our what twelve years minimum twelve years of school, right? So I think that's another angle that as you know you're a you're a girl dad also you know as parents we need to take that opportunity to kind of uh, do a side training um, sort of untraining from what they're being taught in school every day because I you know when I got out of high school and into college my whole thought was like oh I'm gonna go work a corporate job like I'm so excited to work my way up the corporate ladder and get those five percent raises every year. And I, I had never even thought about the alternative behind the curtain until I was, you know, fortunate to have some friends that were much smarter than me that showed me, you know, that that opportunity was there. And then once I tried it out, I was addicted to it. But yeah, my, uh, we, we all have two girls, I believe. And my singular goal for my girls, I will consider, you know, my, my success measure as a parent is that they are aware that there's another way. And that they don't feel like they're sentenced to working a soul crushing job their whole life. That's, Absolutely. that's really the whole ball game for me. Yeah. It's so critical. Kevin, there's been like so many pieces of this discussion that I was just like, man, this like really resonates with me personally. And I can see how valuable it will be for our audience to hear. So I just want to say that like, I really appreciate you sharing your story. And then the cherry on top is that you're an awesome person. 
you can tell from your Twitter threads that you really put it out there and you're just trying to be as good a version of you as you can be. And you're constantly trying to improve. So I have a lot of admiration for you and I really appreciate your time with us today. Thank you very much. That's that's all there is in life is just trying to grow and become better. I love it. Kevin, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on with us. Any books you want to recommend or throw out there to the audience that have uh, helped shape you and help you create these, these impactful and powerful uh, uh, ideas? Yeah, I'm going to give a contrarian answer to this because uh, that's a, a lot of podcasts that I go on. They, they wrap up with this question, like, what are your favorite books? What books would you recommend? And, you know, I'm in a, I used to be a voracious reader and I'm in a stage of life now where I'm more about writing than reading. I still do a little bit of reading. So I'm going to answer that question by saying what I would, um, invite your listeners to do is instead of reading the next book, Try developing a practice of writing. Just start with five or 10 minutes a day. Write down whatever's on your mind. Do it every day. And if you make a habit of it, it will change your life. And so I um, tell young people this often. I was like, education can be become a form of procrastination. And what I mean by that is like, I know a lot of people who read all the business books and self-help books. They go to all the seminars. They take all the courses, and but they're not taking action on it. Right. I think I would challenge people to take those hours and use it to take action. And a great way to start, like a very low cost of entry, low risk way to start is just develop a practice of writing. Go buy a journal and, and start jotting down your thoughts. Love that. Absolutely. That's great advice. Or open up uh, your own Twitter handle and just start throwing out your goals, dreams, thoughts into the wind and potentially uh, the wind might get a little stronger like it did for Kevin. <laughs> anything yeah i mean uh, again i don't i'm not exaggerating when i say if you do that regularly i think most people would find that it changes their life that's awesome uh kevin i know a lot of people are going to want to know where to reach out to you uh can you tell them where we should send them yeah twitter is my hub so uh i'm my handle is at camp four c-a-m-p the number four on twitter um yeah uh give me a follow and uh i still have a policy that i answer all dms Wow. Um, I, I sort of, uh, I'm paying a price a little bit for having that policy because it's getting increasingly hard to keep up. But, uh, but seriously, I consider that part of sort of part of the job is, um, when I, when you post the type of stuff I do, you're going to get a lot of questions, a lot of direct messages, and I respond to all of them. I love it. Yeah. Everyone go check out swellmoney.com. Also, I, uh, on Twitter this morning, I was seeing, uh, someone post that, uh, like interest rate, the average APR now is like up to 20% from like 14% just like a few months ago. That paired wow. with inflation, this is just like an out of control problem that is going to need some serious solutions. And I love that Kevin is working on providing a solution to help this because it's uh, it looks like it's going to be pretty problematic in the coming months. So thanks so much for that, Kevin. You bet. Thanks again, Kevin. Being an entrepreneur is hard. Doug and I struggled for years of being unfulfilled in corporate life before we went out on our own. Then it just got harder when we became an entrepreneur. We started FYF to be a one-stop shop pulling the knowledge and resources from the most interesting and experienced entrepreneurs we could find to help aspiring entrepreneurs have best chance of finding their own freedom. Check out all the resources in our entrepreneurship ebook for free at findyourfreedompod.com. Also, be sure to share this episode with a friend who could use some entrepreneurial inspiration. 